it's a fascinating yet challenging time to be a leader. So much we thought we knew about how to lead and operate is open for question. We're in the midst of a metamorphosis. There are profound shifts affecting the way we work, how and why we do things, and the purpose and meaning we bring to our organizations. And essentially, we are facing a new norm, a new norm that is characterized by unceasing transformation, change upon change upon change. And there's a whole maelstrom of motives contributing to this sea change in business and also in our communities. A leader, uh, a leader of a, uh, a large multinational uh, institution I've had the pleasure of coaching over the last uh, couple of years, uses this a powerful metaphor when describing leadership. Leadership these days is like having to fly a plane, having to retrofit that plane in mid-flight whilst going into increasing turbulence, keeping the ground crew happy, the in-flight crew happy, and all the customers happy. That level of change upon change upon change we're having to deal with. And we just simply can't deal with that level of complexity with yesterday's logic. And as the famous management guru, Peter Drucker, insightfully said, in times of turmoil, danger lies not in the turmoil itself, but in facing it with yesterday's logic. Now, here lies an interesting fact, because often we think that the challenges all around us, these systemic challenges, is where the danger lies. No, there are more systemic challenges coming downstream. It's part of um, a, a, an evolution and a revolution that's happening. The danger doesn't lie in them. The danger lies in us bringing yesterday's consciousness to it. The very level of consciousness that created our problems in the first place. And often we do that unwittingly whilst seeking solutions, noble endeavors, sustainable business, whatever it is, we bring the very level of consciousness that created the problems in the first place. So we need to shift and that requires um, quite a significant undertaking. So yesterday's logic, what is it? Well, it has its roots way back in early human history. Um, as we've written about um, in the regenerative leadership, the journey of separation, I've written in detail elsewhere, you know, really it spawns out of the Neolithic and agricultural revolution, really with an ego explosion, patriarchy, uh, militarized mind and so forth. But it really only accelerates and becomes dominant in our Western way of attending um, over the last three or 400 years or so. Uh, with the age of reason is where it really came in. Um, which was interesting because it followed the uh, Renaissance, which was actually a shift in the other direction. So there was a bit of a pivot and that coincided actually with another shift in climate. Um, and then it became quite extenuated. And it's since then, that heightened separation, um, which really dominates our ways of leading and managing in business and in institutions and in communities today. So it's a mechanistic mindset. And the worldview is one of mechanistic materialism. And uh, whilst the tool of narrowing down and, and focusing in on the parts and engineering solutions and project managing and so forth is actually a really important tool that we need. And it's brought all sorts of advances in modern medicine, technology and transportation that we all enjoy today. There's nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with this machine mindset as a dominant power. When it crowds out other ways of knowing and becomes a dominant worldview, it's wholly unfit for purpose and it actually creates all sorts of problems. So the root problem that we're dealing with today is this mindset, and how do we shift that? And so the number one most important thing facing us as leaders today is this shift in mindset from an essentially mechanistic, control-based, narrowing down, reductive tendency that so much of our managerial thinking is, is caught up in today to an opening, a recognition that our organizations are actually complex living systems. And with that shift, which is quite a profound shift, we start to allow the system to adapt and evolve in its own way. Rather than trying to control and manage it, we actually start to learn to sense and respond. We, we shift our relationship with it. Rather than controlling it transactionally, we start to become in it. We are participating within it. And this shift in dialogue or dynamic, really, from control, manage, into sense and respond is fundamental. Then we start seeing the organization's living system. We start bringing in distributed decision making. We start allowing teams to make change happen at the local level. And they adapt and they evolve in a different way. So the good news is with the shift, because it can feel like, oh my gosh, loads of more complexity for us to get our head around. Actually, um, the answers are within and all around us. You know, when we look deep into nature, as the genius says here, when we look deep, deep, deep into nature, 
three levels of head are um, embodied, really tune into nature. We understand everything better. We see with new eyes. We bring a different quality of consciousness to our solutions than which created problems in the first place. And we look even just in this picture here now, which uh, Laura found, it's a lovely picture. We tune into there and see with our old mindset, mechanistic materialism, we see um, separate species struggling for survival in a dog and dog world. Yeah, and we've been taught this at school, you know, this the selfish gene, only interested in maximizing its own survival. Actually, when we go in with radioactive tracings in the forest floor, we explore what's going on, we bring in more sophisticated instruments, we realize that there's a whole level of uh, participation and facilitation going on all the time. So reciprocity. Uh, yes, there is competition, most certainly, but there's also collaboration going on. And in fact, that the overarching force at play within evolution is one of collaboration. And so we see that separate species are actually sharing nutrients, areas rich in minerals are sharing with areas poor in minerals. Now, we don't wish to superimpose human values over what's happening in nature, but what we can do when we learn from that wisdom is recognize that we can open up and sense in a different way. And what we've done in the regenerative leadership DNA is we brought these different levels of applying living systems thinking into business at three levels, essentially. Living systems design, culture and being. So living systems design really is how do we take patterns and principles and processes that we find within the living systems and apply that to the way in which we design our products and our services. And then a second level is living systems culture. Very simply at the first level, and you're going to go into this in, in, in detail on your journey, but simple example would be, you know, when you go to the airports, you now see many of the wings on airplanes are tipped up. They weren't two decades ago, but now they are mimicking eagle wings. So that's a, a simple mimicry from nature, less drag, more lift. Slightly more complex uh, uh, um, example of living systems design is with the carpets company interface um, multi-billion dollar manufacturer, where they have a factories of forest initiative, learning from biomimicry, learning from how nature works, circular economic design, and ecosystem design thinking, applying that to creating factories that actually sequester more carbon. They actually absorb more pollutants out of the atmosphere than they give off. And the water leaving the factory is cleaner than when it comes in. And there are many examples, the whole revolutionizing space in living systems design that you're going to be exploring on the journey around this area. It's fascinating.